Abby Kaplan is the author of A Doctor Only Pretends, Poems About Illness, Death, and In Between, published in May 2022. Her poems have appeared in Agni, the MacGuffin, Midwest Quarterly, Moon City Review, Pennsylvania English, Salt Hill, Spoon River Poetry Review, the Southampton Review, Tikkun, and elsewhere. Among Abby's rewards, she has been a finalist for the Rash Award in Poetry and the Anna Davidson Rosenberg Poetry Award, a semi-finalist for the Willow Run Poetry Book Award, and a nominee for Best New Poets, Best of the Net, and the Pushcart Prize. Abby is a physician and practices mind-body medicine and counseling in San Francisco, California. Please welcome Abby Kaplan. Thank you. And I just want to say what, a, what an honor it is to read after Kathleen McClung, who is a, such a wonderful poet and a fantastic teacher and, um, and a, such a generous person. So just want to thank her for that. I'll be reading mostly from my collection, <laughs> The Doctor Only Pretends, um, with a few others thrown in between. And uh, I thought I'd start with one of the lighter poems in the collection, which is Ways to Know Your Father Has Alzheimer's. Ways to Know Your Father Has Alzheimer's. When he starts giving your mother the wrong pills, and after she dies, not from the pills, but cancer, when he adopts a man living on the streets and meets him at midnight to help him start a sewing business, when six months later he tells you he's given this man at least $30,000 and to a woman he met in a Walmart parking lot over $80,000 who says she'll kiss him after they marry. When he calls to tell you his cat has been missing for three weeks, the neighbors complaining about streets littered with lost cat signs, later, later learning he unloosed reams of them onto their driveways, and you enter his house, see the stiff carcass by the heating vent, and you have to air out the living room. When he tells you he le loves eating canned olives for dinner and recommends you try it. When he takes your daughter to the children's museum, but misses the exit, ends up on the Golden Gate Bridge and makes a U-turn in the middle when he talks his way out of a ticket and still has his driver's license, despite the psychiatrist's report. When you've moved him to assisted living and you drop nail clippers into your pocket before each visit. When on President's Day, he doesn't recognize the cartoon drawing of Abraham Lincoln in the dining room display. When you watch an attendant tie a blue bib around his neck at the table, and he's not embarrassed. When you are together, looking through an art book in the rec room, and you turn the page to a painting by Rembrandt, Christ on the Cross, and your father, once a respected university professor, says, oh my gosh, what happened to him? Thank you. And uh, another one about my father. My father, our father, my sister Dawn is here somewhere, um, ha, uh, was a health nut. So he was uh, already jogging in the 1960s. Ode to health nuts for Sam. You can hear me okay? Okay. You plastered shaving cuts carbuncles and hernia scars with vitamin E. Tore off hunks of aloe, sucked the juice until your intestines spoke Spanish. Your fridges sprouted stainless steel bowls of bubbling sour yogurt and sauerkraut. You ran circles around tracks, around your detractors, jumped jacks with Jack LaLanne, binged on shark cartilage to avoid the big sea until the world had a shark shortage. 
but you swam your shark laps to keep moving, to keep living, and some of you even lived long enough to watch your minds erased. Today, I ponder my possible fate dealt by online tarot decks of genetic spread, a major arcana of Alzheimer's and macular degeneration. My kitchen drawers bulge with magnesium, omega-3, probiotics, and vitamin D, laced with equal parts science and hope. All hail to you, our prototypes, archetypes, guinea pigs, and vanguards, on whose shoulders we bless our nutrient-rich kale smoothies, farm-to-table boulangeries, and locally roasted single-origin coffees. Farm to your mother, your mouth to me, cow to carnivore, to black bean soup, back to the woman in the paisley shirt and bell bottoms, rolling up her sleeves, digging into her brown rice and tofu dinner. Thanks. So I grew up in LA and this is not in the book. Um, and uh, my father rescued me several times in home ec. He knew how to use a sewing machine because um, his father was a tailor. So uh, it's called L.A. Rain. It takes place in the 1960s. I want my L.A. childhood like I want a Winchell's donut because someday when I'm dying, I'll squeeze all the Fig Newtons hanging from Hollywood palms in my fists and Gordon's corner market aisles will be packed with snowballs. At Winchell's window, I'll order a glazed cruller and sink my teeth into dough so fresh it's a sin. And since I'm dying, why not rub that chocolate cream-filled beauty onto my decolletage? Like Alice's drink me, I'll shrink to mini-me, slide neatly into the Chrysler's passenger seat and cram my mouth with clouds of ready whip. Mom will creep along Sunset Boulevard, windshield wipers on full swipe, Petula Clark sparking boyfriend hope through the radiate, radio. At the fabric store on Highland, we'll choose chintz for my apron for home ec, dash through the down fort part to pioneer chicken for livers in a basket and chocolate malts. I'll listen to the rhythm of the Singer sewing machine as dad sutures the seam ripped apron I can't stop myself from stitching inside out, then patiently decodes Mrs. Manner's guide to ruffle making. Tonight, I hear downtown through my earbuds on my stationary bike. I can't remember what a milkshake tastes like, but I think maybe it tastes like rain. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that I've done in the past is I've taught uh, medical residents, um, doctors who are still training um, in at Highland Hospital. Um, and let me just get the page in uh, Oakland, California, and I wrote a poem called County Hospital Residence. Immigrant doctors training again in a residency program far from home, tripping over English on morning rounds. Tell me how you became a doctor I grew up in Egypt, Vietnam, India, Japan, Mexico, Argentina, China, Peru, Indonesia, Kenya. My father died. My sister died. My mother died. My brother died. I couldn't help. 
Tell me how you became. I was 10 when I got my first pair of shoes. We washed our clothes in the river. I left my mother's village deep in the mountains. Tell me how. I was a medical student stationed in the jungle when a mother banged on my door with her seizing baby. We drove three hours. He died 30 minutes before we got to the hospital. Tell me. I was a cardiologist. My husband hit me. I got away. And now she bends over her patient, looks for bruises. Now he writes orders in the chart, prays they'll be carried out. Now she touches gently Mr. Taylor's cold hand, who lived alone upstairs in his wheelchair in the poorest part of town. Thank you. Um, and uh, I attended medical school in Texas, which doesn't seem to have changed very much <laughs> since I was there in the 1970s. And this is called The Annual Donation Request Reminds Me. It was uh, full of misogyny and, as you can imagine, sexism, racism. We stood behind cool new med school glass, watching Mexican farm workers cross the highway, tend cotton in 110 heat. A classmate said, we worked harder up here in the library, deserved all that future money. Above the old anatomy lab where cadavers slept in formaldehyde, we poured our best years into tomes of pharmacology, then headed to China Express on 4th for exotic oyster sauce, weary of buffalo wings and coke. My lab partner joked, how do you get a hundred Jews into a VW bug? Answer, throw a penny in. While little Laura Garcia, two nights before in the ER, bled from her nose. The head pathologist, sporting a janitorial ring of keys, said the intern packed it with gauze and sent her parents packing a 60-mile round trip to autopsy, pointed out the leukemic drainage on her chest with his scalpel. Later, puckish Dr. P would flash his smile and slides of naked women between cuts of uterine wall. Thank you. And I have a poem. Actually, I think Elise Kazanjan is in this book, The uh, Poets 11. Um, so I wanted to share it with you. I rarely get to share it. It's called The French Quarter. And I wrote it after I went on this remarkable tour. Uh, it's called the Hidden History Tour of New Orleans. And uh, it just made slavery come alive. The end of the poem, I refer to a, a statue by the Chief Justice, former Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court, Ed White, who, who was probably a member of the KKK and, and uh, cemented, helped cement the Plessy Vergus, versus Ferguson ruling. The French Quarter for Mr. Leon A. Waters, who led the tour. When I heard, I was standing in the Grand St. Louis Exchange Hotel in 1842, in the marbled high-domed rotunda below the ballroom where petticoated daughters of businessmen waltzed and their wives applauded the orchestra. I watched them raise their hairy white arms to bid on enslaved husbands and wives and yes, their children, an industry 
of notaries, lawyers, brokers, auctioneers, more exciting than buying from private pen keepers down the street open to walk-ins. When I heard how priests held enslaved girls close, when I heard how plantation owners, fat from all the free labor, cut the heads off freedom fighters, stuck them on sticks on the road to New Orleans, I saw my reflection in the quaint glass window of the slave exchange restaurant. It was 1995 and whips and iron masks, punishment for sucking a bit of cane to, to quell hunger in harvest, decorated the rafters like the ride at Disneyland's Raiders of the Lost Ark. While tourists drank hurricanes, ate crawfish to the soulful call of the white saxophonist until the great great grandchildren of those sold armed only with protest signs finally shut it down. When I heard that I was lit standing on this living museum of horror two blocks from tourists feeding on beignets on so much fodder from horse and carriage hawkers where Angie waitresses three jobs to feed her kids I almost lost it right there on the courthouse steps all over Justice White's bloody bronze shoes. And um, they took that, that in, in December of 2020, they took that uh, statue down, but they put it inside the courthouse. So they removed it, but only to put it inside. Um, so I'm just going to read you the first poem of the book, and it's called Quan Yin, who is the go Chinese goddess of compassion. Quan Yin. A doctor only pretends to understand the soul's transmission through the stethoscope, the placement of bell and drum on bare chest, simple human breath commingling with clicks of worry, raspings of self-reproach, the unpredictable beat of chronic confusion. The details don't matter when loneliness is undone. And the siren I hear through the window reminds me of that normal day when illness held me upside down by my feet and slapped my behind until bright pennies of pain emptied me. Misery comes cheap, and to survive, you must study those bangs of false belief about who you are that blind your third eye. Make your hard pilgrimage from the realm of nightmare into the space of a quiet room, bird calls, and dogs barking in the distance. Everyone who lives long enough slips into the pit. Even my neighbor, who screwed up his face when I said Crohn's disease, later stroked out. And he did not merit my story, how I awoke from my dying to another existence, where water and sand cradled my feet. The gulls cried to give comfort, and I sang the sea's own. Thank you. Um, and then there's a poem about Lilith. And um, according to legend, Lilith was the first wife of Adam. Um, and she was soon banished because she, she wasn't submissive. So, Lilith. No one cares that you jammed your fingers shutting the window against the rain last night, that you can elicit the sharp pain of an osteoporotic fracture, nor your arthritic steps taken at the vast arboretum, mask pulled just below your nose 
to inhale the scent of magnolias. You sit in the quiet shade, yards away from Adam with his wedding band on a similar bench on the other side of the dry mosaic fountain, holding his head as he talks into the phone, messy shine of thick black hair falling over his face, long sleeved gray t-shirt, hackneyed apple in his left hand, th copper thermos perched on it like a snake's head on the concrete near his tennis shoed feet. You look up to watch two healthy crows fling themselves through the sky. Think how you've missed the cold sunshine of autumn in well over a year. Or was it the sixth day, time being a concept unmanaged and abysmal? At the entrance, a clot of couples peruse and point to names of donors etched on bricks, voices carrying through the cypresses. I remember them. Nobody liked her. She didn't die, right? Uh, all right. I'll do them uh, on the occasion of the final anatomy exam, which is the last poem. Um, okay, so imagine that you are a uh, um, medical student, a first year medical student, and you're about to take your anatomy exam, gross anatomy exam. You've just spent a year with your cadaver. For your forbearance, for your pungent chemical repose, for your grayed out bodies, we are saying thank you. How you let us open you in layers, our untutored hands folding back skin, fascia, muscle, bone, separating you like encyclopedia plastic overlays, fishing for organs, vessels, nerves, and hollows. For the hearts we return to chest cavities and covered with cloth, we thank you. Bent over with formalin burning our nostrils, forceps in our gloved hands, and thoughts on the final exam, we are saying thank you. Thank you for the husks of yourselves, your trust in not knowing, never imagining how you would be sundered for our awe in working the pulleys of your fingers and toes, the, indign the indignity of dissecting your genitalia, we say thank you. To grandmothers from nursing homes, middle-aged men who slept in doorways, doctors who once stood with us on this side of the tank, we are saying thank you, thank you. Forgive our surprise at your fingernails, reminding us of parents, friends. Forgive our lab coats smeared with fat, our pitiful humor and rushed greetings to your unveiled faces before we peeled them down to your chins, buzzsawed your skulls, and pressed between our thumbs your brains that once held knowledge of your lives. And of course, this was after W.S. Merwin. Thank you. <laughs>